So I'm Roland McDevitt. Uh, I'm the paddle craft coordinator for District 5 South. Uh, glad to welcome you to this presentation by Joy Tagooting on kayak navigation. It's the fourth in a series of six uh, Zoom sessions that we're doing for uh, OxPad uh, training. And uh, I think uh, you know, we've got a relatively small group and I think there's gonna be some opportunity for discussion. I'm not sure, Joy, exactly how you want to handle discussion. I will monitor uh, questions that are that are asked, but uh, you know, if it's a small enough group and Joy wants to entertain questions, he might uh, he might do that. So I'm going to turn it over to Joey and uh, and take it away, Joey. Sounds good. Thank you, Rollin. Uh, welcome, everyone. Glad to see some familiar faces and to meet some new ones. Truly appreciate you being here this evening. Um, as Ron said, uh, I'm Joey Tagooting. Uh, I've been uh, uh, paddling since about 2014, and uh, I started off uh, as a largemouth bass fisherman on the Potomac River on a powered uh, bass boat, moved to kayak fishing, and now mostly just kayaking for the pure enjoyment of it. Uh, I've been a Oxpad qualifier since about 2019, and um, still having a lot of fun, and Rollin hasn't fired me yet, so I'm just going to keep on going. Um, mm -hmm. We do have a lot of material material to cover this evening. Um, to minimize any disruptions, please be sure to uh, mute uh, mute yourself. But as Roland said, I'm open to uh, questions, discussion. If you un wanna unmute yourself and ask a question, that's fine. Please feel free to do that. If you wanna type it in the uh, chat box, uh, please do that as well. Um, works out just as well for us. All right, let's, let's, start, the, let's start the show. Let me get rid of this one. Let's go to, and everybody's looking at the charts. Let's bring it up to uh, full screen if we can. Everybody good. Um, the following slides that I'm gonna walk through are from Paula Hubbard's website. Paula Hubbard is an avid uh, uh, um, kayaker in the uh, uh, Chesapeake Bay area. Um, I didn't post her, um, I didn't post her uh, uh, website up there, but um, if you go to a Flotilla 1607 website and look down through the Oxpad training, um, there is a link to the uh, to her website as well as uh, one of the presentations she did on this very topic, the kayak navigation and charts. Uh, she did a YouTube presentation back in uh, uh, 2020. Um, so if you do a YouTube search and search for Paula Hubbard, you can find it. Uh, and it was for the Oxpad program back then. Uh, Paula has been paddling for about 16 years. She's been an instructor for about 14 years. She actually started off in California. And that's when she found out the, uh, uh, some of the things about um, open water navigation and then transferring those skills over to the East Coast and how uh, navigating is a little bit different over here because of, of uh, some of the things that she learned there and had to adapt to. So let's go forward. Everybody hear me okay? Sound checks all right there, Roland? All right, sounds good. All right, tonight, um, th these are all the things that we're gonna be covering. Uh, I always hate reading stuff that's on the slides. Uh, you can read it while you as you're listening to me. Um, but these topics that we're gonna be covering, I'm gonna try to cover them from the perspective of sitting in a kayak. Uh, for those folks that are uh, a little bit more uh, powerboat oriented, uh, for those folks that are expert navigators and know about uh, charts and atons and all that, please bear with us and chime in. If I say something stupid or something wrong, please correct me. Um, but from a kayak, um, we're a lot smaller. Uh, we go a lot slower and we can go places that larger vessels cannot go. Generally, we stay out of the channel and hug more of the shoreline unless we're crossing, crossing the channel, crossing the bay. Our kayaks, we don't have large desks. So we don't have the large chart, the plotters, the parallel rules, calipers, all those sort of things. So a lot of what you have to do with the chart, you have to do from home, the comforts of home, your dining room table. Because once you get on the water, you're kind of at the mercy of what you can carry on your front desk, or front deck, excuse me. Um, here's a little bit more about what we're gonna talk about, you know, reading it, hazards, measuring distances, use of a compass, and still some more stuff, you know, shoreline features, aids, latitude and longitude, and that good old country song, The Compass Rose. 
All right, folks, this is a map, right? You can see that, this is a map. Maps focus on land. The water you see here is in blue. The land's kind of in that whitish yellow. Uh, maps show roads, na uh, road names, uh, route numbers, things of that nature. For those that are familiar with it, I believe this is Kent, I Kent Narrows, it says it on there. And so you see some shorelines, uh, some details about the shoreline, but not a lot. Uh, you can see possibly where there are some boat ramps and other places that have water access, but it doesn't provide you with a lot of information about uh, the water. So uh, let's see the magic of uh, her slides here. So this is a chart, same area that was shown in the previous slide. But look at all that information gobbledygook that focuses on the water. It's not much detail about the land, but a lot more information about the water. Um, and we'll cover all these bits of information. Uh, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just let you know so that uh, I, um, it always makes my father-in-law a little upset because my father-in-law was actually a cartographer, a chart ma uh, maker. And um, my sense of direction is terrible, but his sense of direction is, is, is perfectly well. And he will tell me you know, which direction coordinates to follow and all that stuff. And I'm like, I'm the guy that says, take the left at the McDonald's. And uh, he's, he's a little bit more on the spot. So this is a chart, uh, not a lot of detail about the land, but a lot of detail about the water. And we're gonna cover all these uh, symbols that you see here. All the numbers, all the little symbols that you see, all the little uh, um, um, uh, lines that are covered in there. So here's a third view of what we're looking at. It's the same place, but it's using the satellite. So these are all tools that Paula uses at her dis disposal to get a sense of you know, what the roads are, what the land looks like, what the water looks like. And then finally, you know, from a satellite view, it even provides us with some other helpful bits of information, such as, you can see that um, there are some shoreline features. Take a closer look. You see some sandy areas, sandy beaches. You see some marshy areas that are right here, places that are exposed as the tide goes out. You can see to a certain extent, the depth of the water, get a feel for what's deep and what's shallow. And there again, we, we kayakers hug the shallow water, hug the coastline. You can see to a certain extent, some of the hazards or boats or navigation needs that go through here. But what she uses the satellite view for when she's doing this is she explores the possible bailout areas in case of emergency. I heard Glenn talk earlier about the weather coming in. Well, if she's paddling this area and it starts coming in hot and heavy, she's going to be familiar with some areas that she can take out on or on a nice day, put land on a beach. So, you know, they, all these tools provide you just different perspectives. Now, a chart. Charts have all this information on it, but a good chart has something called a legend, um, which describes all the details of that chart. So chart one, and it's available at that website, it's interesting reading if you suffer from insomnia, so please take a look at it uh, at your own uh, time. Um, but it's great detail about what's covered. And you can see that this is a little section about rocks, wrecks, obstructions, and how NOAA charts will look like, um, uh, the uh, National Geospatial charts will have it. So it just gives you, uh, the legend just gives you information about uh, uh, their lexicon for what's on the chart. So as we discussed, charts provide a lot of information about the depth of the water. You can see here that the water is in a variety of colors. Uh, the land, you can see land masses in the yellow, the green marshy areas are exposed when the, when the, when, during low tide. The blue are the shallow, shallow areas that we're gonna hug as uh, kayakers. And the white, white part are the deeper water areas. We, we wanna cross over those as quickly as possible, basically. All right. Joey, excuse yes. me, this is Kathy. I don't yeah. see the colors you just you just um, were uh, describing. I'm, I'm seeing white land, blue water, and that's it. Uh, is anyone else having that issue? I'm looking at my- Yeah, um, yeah we're seeing white and blue, basically. Yeah. We're not seeing the yellow. Okay. Ah, okay. interesting. Um, my apologies. I'm I seeing the yellow and the I see the, the color on my uh, screen. This is Dan. I see everything. Yellow, <laughs> blue, and white. And this is Brian. I see everything. I okay, everybody, it. listen to me. Here's what I want you to do. Cover your right eye and read the letters on the... <laughs> <laughs> 
Just kidding. I might be the, 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 the presentation, the, the, the monitors, those sort of things. Um, but if you're familiar with charts, uh, definitely keep in mind that the, there, are, there are variations in colors. And, um, and, and, and if you go to her slide deck and see it, you'll, you'll be able to, uh, to look at those. But I'll try, to, I'll try to make it as clear as possible. And, and definitely, I apologize for that. I, I have a second monitor that I'm looking at, and it worked for me. So I apologize for this uh, little um, uh, uh, bit of error there. So please bear with me. All right, where are we going at? Right here, we talked about the, and I apologize, some section of white here, some section of blue that's through here, and the landmass that's yellow. The red arrow presently, all the numbers that you see here give the water depth. And even though that the, um, the colors may look the same to you, you can tell by the numbers, the 22 is the depth of the water that's here. You move closer to shore, it's 19 and 17 and nine feet and five feet. And, 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 and this just gives you a sense of what the bottom of the, uh, of, of the water looks like. Um, the, the, the numbers indicate mean low water, usually, usually um, it's the low, lowest tide measurement averaged over a 19 year period. And that's a little bit of trivia there. Most of the soundings or readings of the bottom that you'll see are in feet. There are some charts that do it in um, fathoms, um, mostly in commercial areas. Um, let's go to the next one here. All right. The white lines you see, or the lines you see on the chart, um, basically they're uh, contour lines. Um, just uh, like you have uh, uh, um, uh, geographic uh, lines that uh, uh, give the height or altitude on the, um, on maps, you've got contour lines uh, for, for charts. Uh, and so the number that runs through the middle of it, you, we all, we all, this is all familiar stuff. Uh, um, this is the depth of the water at that point. The red line, the red arrow right here shows it's 12 foot, 11 foot, two feet close to the shore. So, and it's, it's good to keep in mind that these are approximate. Um, the, the, the Water's constantly changing. The depth's constantly changing. I joked with my father-in-law, like I said, I, I, I'm certain that some of the charts that he's developed 50 years ago, um, I, I don't know if readings have been updated. They'll probably say the same numbers, but the water's definitely changed since then. So it's an interesting discussion that we've had at times. All right, let's move uh, moving along here. All right. Uh, I, I apologize, this is the slide that says that uh, white is the deep water and uh, blue is the shallow water, green is the marshy area. Uh, I apologize if you cannot see that or sense that. I'm gonna skip over this chart. This is the basic area we're gonna be covering tonight. Uh, it's Chesapeake Bay, um, right where the arrow is, this is Annapolis, right here. You got the Bay Bridge going from west to east and the eastern shore, Kent Island, where um, uh, um, uh, Brian Grady was telling us earlier that a friend of his is moving to, and we're all welcome for the uh, uh, opening day party there. All right. So if you look at this map, you see all there again, all the symbols and the details. And we talked about where the Naval Academy is, Annapolis is. And we see the legend on the very bottom down here. We see the Compass Rose in the uh, four o'clock position. Okay. So aids to navigation. Um, and, and this is, I know it's an overview. I apologize that if you're, you're more experienced and you know this stuff, uh, but we got a wide range of people that are, are that are uh, attending tonight. Um, let's see, I got a, some on the chat. Okay. Um, let's see where we're going. Tonight's um, discussion there again, will uh, uh, focus on perspective of a kayak. But we'll talk about these aids to navigation and, and, and cover some of them in, in some detail. A little red circle that we're going to, we're gonna highlight that, bring it right up. So this is the entrance to Kent Narrows. There again, you see all the numbers within the red, within the red circle. You see symbols, little triangle, green triangle. You see the letters, you see the uh, numbers themselves. We see the magenta exclamation points filled in circles, square, square, square green boxes, and we're gonna talk about those. 
the number four that you're put, uh, pointing to right now. Um, basically, this is a, um, a light. It's a lighted beacon, and that's what the uh, um, magenta symbol, magenta exclamation point is um, pointing to and is, is, is showing. It's a lighted beacon. It's a flashing red, four seconds, 15 foot height, four mile visibility, and the number that's on it is a number four. So for those folks that aren't familiar with it, this is uh, just an introduction. For those that are familiar with it, uh, I apologize for repeating. So lights can be all different colors. They can be white, they can be red, they can be green. They give an indication. We all know the red right returning, keeping the uh, green on the on the port, all those good stuff, right? I mean, on the um, starboard. So the chart can also indicate uh, whether it's a flashing group uh, or a single flashing and the numbers. I read it a few seconds ago about how this is a flashing red, four second interval, 15 foot height, high beacon that's visible for four miles and has a number four on it. So this one right here, you can see is green, 15 foot, four mile visibility and a five on it. So this just gives you an indication of what you're looking at on the chart. Now, now that I talked about these lighted beacons and the, and, and the chart, the question I'm gonna ask you is, are we ever gonna see those where we're doing a paddle patrol? Anybody know the answer to that? Give you a two count. Depends on where you are. That and uh, and it, are are we talking about whether they're lighted or or uh, or just if we'll see the physical uh, aton? If you're gonna if they're if they're lighted, are you ever gonna see them uh, brilliantly flashing? Uh, in a kayak, probably not, no. unless we're out paddling at night. Yeah, because we do not paddle at night. There you go. And we do not paddle at night. That's the answer I was looking at. So you will not see these lights flashing at nighttime. You should not see on a paddle patrol. That was a trick question. So definitely good answer there. I'm covering them only because they're in uh, uh, Paula's slides, but she gives an overall very good uh, overview of navigation. And some of our folks attending the Oxpad uh, uh, Academy are not too familiar with uh, navigation. So this is just a, a quick overview of um, what's on a chart and what's covered. Let's just keep moving down here. All right, on this chart, the markers are indicated, you know, you're reading it here by black solid dot. They have a fixed, a, 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 a fixed spot, a fixed location. For example, it's a piling. So the exclamation point you can see is a light but it's on a fixed piling of some sort, right? And it gives you some indication on the chart what you're looking at. And basically the magenta exclamation point says that it's a light. Here's just some examples of the markers that you're gonna be seeing. Uh, green markers are square, have an odd number, red markers are triangle, even numbers. And this is what they're gonna look like on the, on the chart green green uh, marker number three, red marker number four. Who could tell me what this number two is? Day board. That's the water depth. There you go, it's the water depth. The day board is number three. That's, uh, that's what's on there. Very good. Day markers on a post, on piling, don't have a light. Red triangles, all right. Here's what they look like in real time, folks, or not real time. Here's what the real picture of them looks like. So this is along Kent Island. Markers that have an open circle at the base are, are anchored. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. What the red arrow shows that these, these, these markers are not fixed. They have a base that base that the marker uh, moves with the current. Right? Two types of buoys, cans and or nuns. Cans or nuns are indicated by the open circle. Color is green and it is a can number seven shown here. Open circle 
because their location is not fixed exactly. There'll be some leeway. Those are not directly fixed to the waterbed or the bottom of the, of the, of the ocean or river water. They are usually anchored by a large concrete block. And, and, and these buoys can be moved by strong currents, storms, or even ice. Basically, this is what you're looking at. As the current moves, it'll go one way, and then it shifts to the other. There again, it's an open circle. So if you look for an open circle, it's a buoy, they're not fixed. The green markers are called cans, of course. That's what a can looks like. Now, here's the thing about this, and I'll probably repeat it. When we're on a kayak and the visibility is uh, hard to see, hazy day on the, um, on the bay or fog, you may not see the number on the buoy, but you'll be able to hopefully tell the color and the shape, which will provide you a presence of where you're at. And that, we'll talk about that some more. Because if you happen to see a, a green you know, can, look on your chart, figure out where you are or where you think you are. Here's an example of a, a red marker or a nun buoy. Notice that it's an open circle. The diamond is red, indicating that it's a red marker, red nun buoy. Here we go. And like I said, hopefully you'll be able to see at a distance. If you look over in the distance and you see something that's red and nun shaped or conical shaped, you'll be able to get a good idea of where you're at because you don't want to paddle all the way over there and say, and just to look at the number, well, you might want to, it all depends on your level, level of exertion that you want to put out there. All right. What this provides you with is just an idea of when you're planning your trip on the chart, you get an indication of those um, markers that you're gonna be running by or seeing or bumping against or whatever you wanna call it. We'll talk about those some more. So that's what they're gonna look like on your chart. Green number nine, flashing green every four seconds. Red number six, flashing red every four seconds. All right, there again, this is Annapolis. Annapolis is over here on this side where I'm circling. You can see the city of Eastport. See all the numbers there, all the channels there, all the little red markers and symbols. Remember the filled in circle is fixed. Exclamation point is a, has a light. The open circles are not fixed and swing with the current. So these are things that you're gonna get familiar with the more that you look at a chart. Green squares are odd numbers. There's Joey, green. I have a question. Yes. Um, what is, is there a specific reason why the ones with the, um, the circle that's not closed, why those are not fixed? Is there, I mean, is, are they supposed to move with the current or the tide, is that? Um, yeah, uh, the the ones that okay, the ones that are um, open circled and not fixed, like this one I'm pointing here, number yeah, uh, um, number six. I think it's just an easier way to drop them off. Uh, um, and um, let me go back a little bit because you have the big concrete block that you, you just drop off, you chain to, and so it just floats with the with the current as opposed to putting something. 25 feet down and locking it in place. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, Joey. Uh, so Go for what it, happens Glenn. a lot of times is, um, you know, if they're shoaling, if that's uh, prevalent in the area and they have to move the channel, they'll, they'll uh, use that uh, method if I put in something more uh, permanent. Okay. So it's, ma it's mainly just a convenience thing and not a uh, water marker. It's not, I mean, you don't have to have one of those just um, to move with the current. That's what I'm saying. It's only um, placed that way because of the convenience, correct? 
Well, I think what Glenn is saying, like uh, at Oregon Inlet, down where we are, we've got a lot of uh, sandbars that shift around. And so they're constantly moving those channel markers uh, because the channel's moving. So it, it, okay. makes it, it makes it easier to relocate those uh, channel markers. That makes a lot of sense. I'm just, I'm on uh, Lake Erie, and I've only been out to the ocean a few times, so I'm not used to seeing those. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Rollin. Great question. Like I said, I don't know it all, and I'm 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 glad that other people are pitching in here. All right, charts also have um in the Bay Area, it's 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 pretty flat, so there's not a lot of land features. Uh, in this area uh, around Annapolis, you, you look at the landmarks and you can and, and try to get an indication of where you are. Uh, this red circle that uh, I'm I'm playing with the mouse, it's it, you should be able to see three towers on this uh, uh, three radio towers on this landmass here. Over by Annapolis on the left hand side, there's the Annapolis Capitol Dome. There's a couple of church domes, church spire. And you should be able to look at that when you're on the water and get a sense of where you're at. There's another um, a, a, a water tank down here at the um, underneath or below Eastport. So these just provide you with visual reference points that if you're sitting out here in the water, you can get a pretty good indication of what uh, what direction, where you're looking at. Uh, so that's what the charts will help you uh, figure out your your where your what your location is. Some of the other things about charts is that um, this, this chart here has a wreck and it, it gives an indication that some of the uh, superstructures should, will be showing. But um, uh, from my understanding, Paula says this is wreck is long gone. It chart just hasn't been updated. So the word of caution is that um, um, just like any other roadmap or chart, uh, it's only as good as uh, as soon as it's printed, uh, the paper that it's on, and things are constantly changing, like Roland and, and Glenn say. Uh, so you have to be aware of um, what you're looking at um, may not be there, or there may, may be some new stuff that hasn't been put onto a chart yet. So it's a, a, it's a dynamic environment that's constantly shifting. Um, um, Paula, Paula talks about this uh, super uh, um, uh, buoy that's maintained down here. And uh, that's just a di different symbol that you'll see on the chart. All right. I'm gonna skip over these. All right, what do we got here? All right, so as I just mentioned, charts uh, don't accurately, oftentimes don't accurately represent uh, what the current uh, uh, features look like. And some of that is exactly what uh, Rollin and Glenn said, it's, it's constantly shifting. Um, this chart right here is um, on, the, on the Eastern shore, Tompkin Inlet. Um, and what you're looking at is a um, old Coast Guard station tower right here. And as we move through the slides, you'll see that the barrier islands have shifted actually. So, so, you can see that the Coast Guard station is now inland. The inlet has shifted to the north. You can no longer get through there. And, and that's where you know charts, they'll try to help you out, but they're not entirely correct sometimes. So you just have to use them with caution. So um, Paula was saying at one point that she was sitting here and had her GPS out and it's telling her that she's clearly in the water and um, she's not, she's sitting on land because uh, those things have not been updated at that point. So. Just the word of caution. Here, this slide shows the transposition that Paula did with, uh, you have the chart underneath it, the satellite view, and you can get a good sense of uh, what everything looks like through here. And uh, she uses this a lot when she's planning out her, um, uh, her, uh, uh, her routes, her, her, her trolls that she takes. So charts have scale to them. Um, and what that means is that uh, how much detail is being shown. And I always get this confused. Uh, um, I always uh, get this wrong. The bigger the number after the colon, and we'll, we'll talk about this, the bigger number after the colon, the one colon, one to 40 representation, the bigger number um, is a smaller scale map. And we'll talk about that some, some more. Um, what that means is it covers uh, a large, larger landmass. Um, charts that have that cover large landmass don't have a lot of detail. 
the bigger the number after the colon, the more earth area is shown, but it doesn't have a lot of information. Uh, the big number after the colon is for a small scale map and um, small scale maps don't have a lot of de detail, don't provide a lot of detail. Oh, this will make more sense the next one we go to. For kayaking, uh, one to 40,000 is, is, is pretty good for kayaking trips. It's one to 40,000 is a larger scale map and they provide a little bit more detail about the land mass that you're looking at. So the smaller number is, is actually a larger scale map and this will make sense on the next slide. Right here, this is a rock hall on the Eastern shore. A uh, picture on the left is uh, 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 one to 40,000. And as you can see, it doesn't show a lot of area, earth area, but it's got a lot more detail. Picture on the right, it's a uh, one to 80,000. It's got humongous land, uh, earth area that it's covering, but it doesn't provide a lot of detail uh, uh, on the inlet getting into rock hall. Doesn't show you a lot of detail about Swan Creek, or even the buoys that are in there on the left-hand side. So that's the difference between the scale of, of the maps that you use. Uh, more or less, uh, for kayakers, we'll probably use the, the 1 to 40,000 because that gives you a lot more feature for the areas that you'll be exploring. The marshy areas, the channels that are gotten through here. The one on the right, well, there's just no way we're going to cover this in a day or so. <laughs> so those are the different... Uh, uh, um, um, scales that you'll see on charts and that's where they come in handy to to know those differences take a drink here latitude and longitude we're all familiar with those we've heard them uh latitude they run parallel to the equator here's the equator right here they run parallel they run east to west left to right as the picture shows and they're always the same distance between them. So here's the equator, here's a lat line of latitude going to north, red lines of latitude going south. Longitude, they parallel the prime meridian through, I believe it's Greenwich, uh, 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 England, international date line on the other side. Um, and they run north to south, north pole to south pole. The distance between them narrows as it approaches the poles. And the distance between them is wider at the equator. I like to think of them as the orange slices. That's what you're kind of looking at. Now the intersection between the two, latitude and longitude, hold on a minute, let's go back, sorry. Every location on Earth can be found by these intersection of these lines, by an intersection of these lines. The, between, the, between them or at the intersection of each line has a specific point. As uh, this, sh this shows here, the coordinates for the, uh, Jonas Green Park that is near the Naval Academy on the Severn River are right here, 38 degrees. 59 minutes, 45.6 seconds north, and 76 degrees, 29 minutes, 3.6 seconds west. That gives you an exact location for Jones Point Park. Let's see if our animation will help us out here. Draw the horizontal line and the vertical, and the uh, um, longitude, Latin long. And right there, it's kind of hard to see on the screen there, is where Jones Point Park is. So every place on Earth can be identified by the intersection of Latin and long. Okay? Pretty simple concept. One way to check out your work, and, and I'm glad that she... I'm gonna have an academy in a couple of weeks and we do a five mile patrol. And what I've done for those folks that are uh, familiar with the DC area, we take out, we launch at Columbia Island. Uh, Columbia Island is right next to this uh, big thing called the, the Pentagon. You may have heard it once or twice. 
we come out of the little inlet there. We go uh, kind of north to, up to um, up the Potomac River, around Teddy Roosevelt Island, come down to uh, Georgetown Park uh, 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 by the Kennedy Center, by the cherry blossoms. And I've, I use this as a, um, uh, I plotted our course and just kind of given latitude and launch each, longitude each one, just so that we have an idea of where we're at, what the location is. So for every place on the planet, we can identify where our location is according to Latin long. And Rollins done the same thing for his five mile paddle. Sorry, Rollins, I didn't bring that up. I don't have a quick uh, uh, access to that one that you do. All right. Knowing your units of Latin long is, uh, is, is great. Um, and they can, as I shown in that um, previous, bring it back up. The same location can be displayed in three different ways. Uh, degrees, minutes, seconds, shown in the center, decimal degrees on the columns on the left, degrees, decimal minutes on the right. So they can be displayed in, in, in several different, different uh, fashions. So let's see here, this is exactly what Paul is talking about. Degrees, minutes, seconds, degrees, minutes, decimal, and degrees, decimal. So, the danger of that is it's easy to make a mistake. Right now, we're looking at the degrees, minutes, seconds, the correct uh, um, Latin long for Jones Park, Jonas Park. But if you entered it wrong using the seconds as decimal minutes, you'll be somewhere out in the Severn River. You can see here. You might still be able to see your location, but you're not exactly where it's you want to be. Then if you really screw up, and enter decimal degrees using min using minutes as decimal degrees, you are way off course. And this could be a major error. Here's Jonas Park way up here. And this is where this incorrect entry will take you. That's a lot of paddling. I don't think I could cover that in a day, but- uh, Joey, uh, one comment. Uh... I noticed when I come up to Maryland to uh, or to the Potomac to go on patrol with you that uh, your station uses a different convention than we do. I think you're using degrees, minutes, and seconds. And yep. down Station Oregon Inlet, we're using degrees, minutes, and decimal minutes. So uh, it's it's not it's not even uniform across the Coast Guard. And, and it's interesting that you, you, you say that, and uh, we, we're gonna cover this problem. Uh, I think Mitchell Mutnick is, uh, Mutnick is probably gonna cover that in the... Uh, ...on the, uh, the, 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 the difference in, in usage. Um, when we report in, we actually try to find a, 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 um, a, a, a marker that we all can identify with, such as, we're underneath the bridge at Teddy Roosevelt Island, or we're next, uh, we're in front of the um, uh, Georgetown Harbor, or we're in front of the uh, Kennedy Center, just so that when we report in, we don't have to call these numbers in and get confused. It's, it's great to know them, and, and, and that's where uh, uh, navigating comes in, in definitely useful. Um, but when we call in a patrol, we can give them the marker that we're next to or some other identifying uh, landmark, which is very helpful. But let's say that you have an emergency and someone calls in, reports in and gives you these, the ability to manipulate those, transpose them and get a sense of where you're at will, is, is very helpful to have. It's a useful tool. I haven't embedded that into my memory yet, uh, but I'm glad that we all have these uh, little computers we carry in our, 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 our persons at all times, because there are programs and apps out there that help us make these conversions and, and, and readily make it easy to, um, uh, to change them from one thing to the other. So thank you for bringing that up, Roland. That's definitely a great point. So let's move in, moving on. True North. True North are where the lines of longitude converge, the North Pole. Yellow line is, uh, is showing the um, uh, uh, true north. The magnetic north is shown using the red line here. That's the magnetic core for the earth 
and that moves the magnet ma magnetic core the magnetism of the earth actually moves it's not in the same location um so true north the yellow line and magnetic north are not the same they're actually it's something called a, a variance um and it's good it's good to know that <laughs> Some, some compasses have a correct or corrected compasses and will compensate for the variances. But most of the kayak comp compasses are not corrected. So, you know, hold your compass so that, it, so that the uh, needle points toward the magnetic line and rotate the bezel so that you have a better indication of what, what uh, your, 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 your course is, your, what you're looking at. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll cover that in just a bit here. All right. So with the compass rows, you have 360 degrees, right? You have two circles here. You have an outer circle, which is the true, true direction, true north, all the lines of longitude meet. Then you have the inner circle, which is the magnetic direction. Typically, the outer circle will align with the grid lines on your chart, all right? But the difference between these two circles, as we mentioned, is called a variance. And, and it's measured in degrees between the Earth's true North Pole and the actual magnetic North Pole. And the variation will, will either swing either west or north. The variation in the Annapolis area is 11 degrees. So even though true North is at zero, the variation for the Annapolis area, what is that? Uh, as you can see here. North. Magnetic North. Does that make sense to everybody? And this thing changes. This magnetic North changes annually. Um, Paula gives a great uh, description of this variation and uh, variance and how she had difficulty uh, moving from the west coast to the east coast because the variation on the east on the west coast is different from our variance here so knowing where you're at and knowing what uh, your chart says uh, is very helpful to information to have this will all come together in just a momento boys and girls So, so all those things in mind, longitude, latitude, true north, uh, magnetic north. For power boaters and sailors, um, the most challenging thing about navigating when they, once they move to a kayak is that in a kayak, it's very hard, very difficult to hold a steady course in a kayak. Um, you're always bouncing around, the winds are pushing you, the currents will always be pushing you. Even your paddling technique uh, is important because even the paddle stroke that you're using and, and your efficiency of that for that stroke will, will push you off course. Um, you're gonna be bouncing back and forth, plus or minus several degrees. So you use your compass as uh, compass heading as a general direction. When you get closer to your destination or your target, you're probably gonna rely more on visual uh, aids, your atons, your landmarks, your shoreline features that we talked about earlier tonight. Um, for a power boat, um, if you're off by a degree, um, after so many uh, miles, let's say five nautical miles, uh, your destination, you may be off by a 10th of a nautical mile. Not very significant, you, you think, um, because you're probably gonna use your, uh, your visual aids and say, oh yeah, I see where I'm supposed to go and make adjustment. But if you are in a power boat, and you're off by 10 degrees, after five miles, you may be off your destination by uh, nine tenths of a mile. I mean, this could be significant in a power boat or a paddle craft. So uh, being able to measure these distance, accurate, accurately plan your course, it's a, it's a big deal. Now, this is very important for open water. Um, for Oxpad, we probably won't be doing a lot of open water uh, traverses, but this is good to know information just, just in case. So 
let's do a little bit of uh, planning. So let's put a little course together. We're gonna go from the Eastern shore of Maryland to the Western shore. We're gonna start off um, from, from a point over here and uh, go to over there. So the course is where you wanna go. You identify your start point. You start identify your end point. You draw a line to indicate your anticipated course that you wanna paddle. This blue line is showing a course across the bay. Let me get to, uh, I'm out of sync with my slides. I apologize, I'm too busy talking and not flipping. The blue line is the course you wanna take. The red line is your heading. And, and, and some folks get that confused and say, well, aren't they say same thing? Nope, the course is where you wanna go. Heading is actually where you are pointing. It may not be the same course or direction that your course is. Then there's another thing called a bearing. And a bearing is a direction to another object, right? And you're not pointing at that object. You're not heading towards that object. It's just an object to give you a bearing, a, a reference point, All right? Those will come in handy in just a minute. So here's our trip. And you do this from your, your dining room table. You're launching from the Eastern shore, a place called Mattapique and you're paddling to Annapolis Harbor. We're assuming no, uh, no winds, no current, okay? You got the start point, you got the end point, you're gonna put a line in between. Bang, you got your line, that's where you're going. That's your anticipated course. Then while you're sitting at your, your dining room table, you use a set of parallel rules or straight edge to slide a line parallel to, your, to the course through the center of your compass rose. This is, this is all cool and, and dandy. Um, uh, Ron Price, he does this at a picnic table during our Oxpad academies. And he does it with a, a bit of string. And, and he does that, he, he, he lines it up and he uses it just as a rough estimate to, to plot a course. He actually ties the bit of string into nautical miles, and, I'll sh and, and, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But that way he can plot a, uh, plot, uh, plot a course and have a measurement for how many miles that plot actually is. So we got our course, we've taken that course to the compass rose to give a, to re get a reading of our course in degrees from the compass rose. We pointed at the outer ring and we see that it's 284 degrees true. The inner ring, it's 295 degrees magnetic. We could have taken the variance from 284 and achieved 295, but the compass rose is there, so we're just gonna use it. So that's our course, 295 degrees magnetic. That's where we wanna, that's what we wanna follow. Now we know our course direction. So, but we wanna measure the distance just as well. So there again, we have um, calm winds, no current, and we find, want to find the distance that we're going to be traveling. So as you can see, that was just done here. I don't know if folks caught that little movement right there. Use the scale, and we're going to use that scale that's on your, on your, your legend, your key there, or we are going to use the um, um, a minute of latitude to measure a mile. One minute of latitude is a nautical mile. So you can use that lat, that's on the left-hand side here, to also measure out a distance. We use that and then we carry it over, bring it over using calipers or a nautical mile ruler and plot our time, our distance. Each of these is a mile going out. So just looking at them, counting it out, we can see that it's gonna be about four and a half miles to get to our destination. So folks go, well, what difference does it make? I mean, why do I care about the distance? Uh, because you as an individual wanna know your skill level. Can you even paddle that distance? Can you paddle 4.5 miles? What about your group? Can the, uh, um, can the least skilled member in your group paddle that 4.5 miles, especially in open water? 
if a storm is approaching, can you paddle that distance in sufficient time? How about before sunset? You wanna get off the water, can you do it? So this gives you the timeline as to our, our distance that you should paddle and, and traverse. Um, and help me out here, folks, a, a, a good paddling stroke is about three, three miles in an hour. A very leisurely paddle is about two miles in an hour. So given those, those timelines, it's gonna take you a couple hours to paddle that. But you also wanna account for the slowest member of your group, for taking pictures, for taking breaks because of the heat, for traffic. There are gonna be other boats in this area. So as these boats are going through, you're gonna pause and you're gonna wait for them to cross because those boats are moving pretty fast and you're gonna, you're gonna wait for them until the traffic is gonna be clear. Now, right about now, I always ask, what's the fastest that you can move across this channel? And hopefully everybody's response is only as fast as the slowest paddler because your intent is to stay together as a group, all right? All right. One of the things that Paula does is she draws these things called cheat lines. And what these cheat lines are is that um, basically they're all pointed to um, magnetic north and she draws them out every mile. That way, if, um, if she doesn't have the scale, she doesn't have the compass rows, but she has these cheat lines, she knows that she can align her compass up to any of these cheat lines and she can get a sense as to what her direction is, what her distance is. And she does this well ahead of going out on the water. She charts this out, uh, co copies a chart, uh, um, puts it all together on paper so that she has a, a good sense of what her, her route is going to be. Does that make sense? I love it, cheat lines. And it helps even if you don't have your compass rows on the map. She can do it with, she does these, she draws these cheat lines so that she doesn't even need the compass rows. Pretty good technique. So how fast do I paddle? How long is it gonna to take to reach your destination? Speed helps you plan your estimated time. As we saw, it was 4.5 miles. Some people can do that pretty fast. Um, three miles an hour, that's pretty fast. Two miles an hour, that's gonna be more realistic for some of the uh, slower paddlers and traveling in groups. So that gives you a sense as to um, uh, how fast, how far you're going to be going. To estimate the time it will take you to reach your destination, you have to know your paddling speed. And, and even if you know your paddling speed, like I said here, most paddlers, about three knots over an extended period of time, you've got other things that are going against you. Um, our assumption was that there was no wind, that there was no current. Um, there is the, this thing called, um, uh, where is it at? Do, 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 do. Speed over water. That's the speed that you're moving through, through the water. If the water's sitting still, you know, you, you, you're doing pretty good. Um, but it's your speed that's moving through, through the water. There's something else called speed made good. This is your actual speed traveling across the water. Here's the difference. If you're paddling um, uh, 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 10 knots pretty fast, but, but you're traveling with no current you know, uh, against you, then your speed made good is 10 knots. But if you're traveling 10 knots and you're traveling against the current that's going two knots, your speed made good is, or excuse me, paddling with, if you're paddling 10 knots and you're traveling with the current going two knots, your speed made good is faster. You're going 12 knots. You're going with the current. If, however, you're paddling 10 knots and you're traveling against the current that's going two knots, your speed made good is less. It's eight knots. So there's all these variables that are taken into place as you're paddling. And there again, you take your wind, your, 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 your current, all those things. So you've done this plotting. You've done this... Uh, time trials to get a sense of how long it takes you to get where you're going. Um, but you've done all this planning. And so at a certain point of time, 
you, you, you go, okay, where am I? So here we are again. You, you, you started the start point. And after an hour of paddling, you go, where do you think you are? So if you're going three knots right here, this is where you're supposed to be, right? You should be able to see this green can right here, can number seven. There's a can there. So you should have passed by that around the one hour mark. If you didn't, then it's one of those deal, where am I? Where's Waldo? How do I find out where I'm at? Some of the things you might do is look for the landmarks. What objects can you see to get a sense of where you're at? There again, we talked about the low shoreline in the bay. So we might be able to see, do that again. We might be able to see the towers that are on this point right here. This is Greenberry Point, and there are three radio towers. Can we see that? Take another look over here. We should be able to see the Bay Bridge. It gives us a reference point where we're at. Take a look behind you. Looking back over to the east, we should still be able to see the where we left, the radio towers, Greenberry Point. All these things are helpful to taking a bearing. Remember again, that's a, where you point your compass at an object to figure out what your current location is. So you've been paddling for an hour. You notice that you, you, you did not pass green can number seven. So you, you take a bearing. You put your needle on the object, or excuse me, to, you point your needle towards magnetic north and rotate the dial to red and put red in the shed. That little animation there. People always told me that. It's like, it's like until they finally showed me. It's like, oh, that makes sense. So this needle now is pointing towards magnetic north. This object Magnetic reading at 335 degrees, magnetic. So let's do that with those things we can see. Here's the Bay Bridge, 31 degrees, mag magnetic. Here's Greenberry Towers, 343, 343 degrees, magnetic. We draw these now recognize you're doing this now on the on your deck you're doing this on your kayak at this point in time because you're lost and don't know where you are. So you draw your bearing lines that go through both objects okay. These are the two bearing lines that you put the intersection is where the magic sauce happens and that's where your location is according to this chart, you should be next to this red flashing buoy with a bell. It has a gong, you should be able to hear it. You should be able to see it. You should also be able to see that you are off this point, Troy Point right there. So these are where you know, course heading and bearing is very helpful. Go back to that. Go on here, I'll try to speed it up running behind there, Roland, my apologies. There are other things called natural ranges. Natural ranges are when you have two objects. We have the Bay Bridge up here. We have a green can seven. You draw a line through them both. If you are, if you have these objects lined up in a straight line and you are sitting on that line, you are you know you are somewhere along this point. So that just gives you an indication of where you're at. These are all good things to know just when you've gone astray. All right. That's what a natural range is. All right. So big part about boating and navigating is avoiding collisions. Who has the right of way? Actually, it's every vessel's responsibility to avoid a collision. Of course. 
The biggest thing is when you're in a group, a kayak group, the object is to stay together. What you're looking at here with kayak here, kayak here, kayak here, kayak here, this powerboat is actually going through an obstacle course. He's got to, he or she has got to, got to figure out if they want to do a kayak slalom through here and figure out how to weave through them. Or he has to figure out how I can go all the way around it, swing wide. Um, this is not a good deal, folks. You want to be in a good, close group so that the power boater has a better sense of where we are, where you're at. All right. This is a good kayak group. That doesn't mean that everybody's bumping into each other. It it's basically means that you're in a good group that this power boater has, has two ways, this way or this way to get around you. He doesn't have to uh, uh, worry about having to slalom through uh, a, a loose group. Basically a kayak group means uh, staying close together and traveling at the same rate of speed. Here's some other good uh, verbiage, you know, always keeping a lookout and uh, actions to avoid collisions. Everyone I hope has heard of the, uh, uh, the rule, constant bearing, decreasing range. If you're taking a bearing and you see a boat approaching you, then a few moments later, you take another bearing and that boat is, same, is approaching you on the same uh, uh, bearing, you're in, you're in a world of hurt because eventually there's gonna be a collision. So, and most of it's intuitive. If you're on the same bearing and, and, a, and you take a, a reading in a moment later and you're still on the same bearing, take action, change your course. And what I mean by that, take substantial action. Go behind the boat. Don't cut, try to cut across it. You're not gonna make it, go behind the boat, all right? I love this um, uh, uh, rules of road hierarchy that uh, Paul has put together here. Um, a great way to remember it is that uh, um, new reels catch fish, so purchase some. The, this is the hierarchy of, uh, of vessels, uh, vessels that are not under command, have the, most, the highest level of, uh, of, of, of respect there. Restricted maneuver maneuverability, constrained by draft, a fishing vessel, a commercial fishing vessel, a sailing vessel, vessel, a powerboat, and a seaplane. I don't know why a seaplane's there, but okay. So this is the acronym to, or mnemonic to, to remember, new reels catch fish. So purchase some in order to remember the rules of hierarchy on the water. And I, I love how Paula points out, there's no K in here. So we have no, no designation in this hierarchy. We, we should, we should just give way to all the other vessels. Um, just some words of wisdom, paddling in the uh, uh, chest beak. You know, the, the big ships move faster than what you, what you think they are. So try to stay out of the shipping channels, monitor traffic VHF channels. Um, using your charts, knowing your boundaries. Um, what Paula does when she's crossing the channel, she likes to go up to the channel, right up to the uh, uh, edge of the channel. Then she will position her boat so that it's perpendicular to the channel. That way it's a visual cue to the power boater that you're not intending to go across at that very moment, um, but that you're observing and watching and waiting to see what the traffic looks like. Now in a group, what you wanna do is come up perpendicular to the cha uh, perpendicular to the channel, and all line up abreast so that you're all side by side and can travel across as one big large group. Um, let's see. That's that's the hour, folks. That's the summary of um, uh, charts navigation. Uh, I'd like to thank Paula Hubbard for allowing us to use these slides. Uh, there again, go to her YouTube channel, take a look at it. Um, it she provides greater detail than I've done this evening, um, but it's up there and available for all to see. Uh, Roland, that is all I have. Um, 
I appreciate everybody's patience in sitting through this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, if folks have questions. I'm open for any discussion. Roland, Joey, where would you like to take I, I just want to say that this is a lot of uh, heavy going material and you did a great job on getting us through it in just over an hour. So uh, thank you very much. Um, and you know, let's uh, let's take a few questions if people have them. I, I do want to uh, respect people's time, but uh, I thought that was a really good uh, high level overview for navigation. Yeah, it was. Joe, and you guys said, in case I want to review this on my own, you guys said it's going to be on the website. You are recording because I saw the message that you are recording. Yes. Good. Fine. We are recording. All right. Uh, so, any, any questions that people have for Joey? Seeing none, hearing what, none. What will we need to demonstrate as far as competency um, during our PQS? Um, in regards to navigation? So basically your, the basic element is you're, you're navigating to a, a point. So we, we'll, we'll, we'll probably for you, we'll chart out ahead a course, uh, which as Joey showed is a series of, uh, of uh, latitude and longitude points on a chart. And what we generally do is ask a, a different uh, participant in the group to, to navigate from one point to the next. So it's basically getting that, uh, um, help me Joe, it's not the heading. You're good. It's the uh, course, uh, the, uh, the course. The course. Right? And yep. uh, so, so if we say, uh, you know, 270 degrees magnetic and it's gonna be, one mile. We'll ask uh, Glenn to uh, take the lead for that leg of the trip. And Glenn will use his compass to, to guide the group on that course to that, uh, to that next point. And so he'll be looking at his watch, judging the, uh, the speed of the group and uh, judging when we get to that point. And, and also, you know, looking at landmarks uh, or channel markers that, uh, that might be points of reference that we see on the charts. So it's, it's basically a, a, a practical uh, use in a, you know, we're not crossing uh, the Chesapeake, but uh, basically give you some practical experience in using your compass and, and landmarks to, uh, to chart a course. That's one of the things that Paulette advises. Uh, some folks have that compass on their deck of their kayak. Um, it's actually hard to read that thing. <laughs> We're constantly uh, bouncing around or we're trying to get it pointed in the right direction. And my eyesight's not that great, so I can't see that far. But having a handheld compass is, is valuable. Uh, some folks, my watch might uh, provide me with uh, some of that uh, uh, with a compass, but something close by that allows you to uh, the flexibility of being able to move. So that's why we advise having a handheld compass of some sort. Yeah. I, um, I think one of the things that uh, a watch is incredibly helpful. You know, if you know that you're going uh, three knots or two knots, uh, you really do need to just be checking your time. I've, I've made that mistake before where I just sort of was oblivious to the time and then I paddled right past the, uh, the point where I should have been making my turn because I wasn't paying attention to the, to the time. When you're out in patrol, time is definitely uh, uh, um, uh, something to keep in mind and having a watch is valuable because not only for the charting and navigate, navigating, uh, but when we're on patrols, paddle patrols, we have to keep watch with the station. Uh, usually it's a 30 minute watch and we have to call in at a 30 minute interval. So having a watch is a valuable uh, item to have. Um, for those folks that are getting GPS uh, uh, enabled um, uh, radios, VHF radios, um, you know, get familiar with your, with your VHF, as, as Roland will say. There, there you go, Aaron. There you go. Perfect. Um, it's not something that we, we will require or mandate, uh, but be familiar with it because it has a compass on it. it can, and you, it, you can put a, a, a point, a, a points out there, a waypoints out there, um, whether you have your GPS on your, uh, your, your radio or whether you have a, a, another electronic device that does the same thing, your Garmin. Um, just get familiar with each one of those uh, in case you drop your compass overboard, in case you, you need to plat something. Um, just a, a nice to have type of deal. 
Out of curiosity, well, the, the, this is specific to us, but uh, what format GPS should we be using for Station Washington? Uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds. Right there, degrees. exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and yeah, so you can adjust, you can adjust your radios to, to those as well. And that's why I plotted this the way you've seen it online, because it, 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 it's different from, from station to station, which is kind of interesting. And as I said earlier, um, uh, and matter of fact, Ron Price pointed it out, is if you, if you do your um, calls right around the marker point, you can use the marker instead. Oh, I'm, I'm channel buoy number three, I'm at red you know, four. That may, way it makes it a lot easier than rather than calling out the uh, Latin long, but that's just a, a possibility. Great, great questions. And, and so Aaron, will you be, are you volunteering to do our navigation and the Oxpad Academy? Every attendee is required to talk about a specific topic, uh, eight to 10 minute discussion. Um, I can write you down for giving us an eight to 10 minute discussion on the, uh, on your, on your topic. I, I don't mean to point, put you on the spot at this point. It's all good. It's this all good. is my weakest topic. I have so many Aaron. weaknesses. I'm a sieve and I, I, so it's all good. I understand. Aaron, this is Kelly Rudolph. I can guarantee you're not as weak as I am. <laughs> No, this I mean, is the best way to learn is to try and teach. So exactly, and I, I think that's the beauty of the uh, that's the whole idea of these presentations is to really own uh, some piece of these topics, and then uh, you know get used to talking about it to, to other people. So I think that's uh, that's really a valuable part of the training. So uh, I uh, you know I want to I want to uh, keep it timely here, and I really. Uh, I think we, you know, you did a great job, Joey, and good questions. Uh, if there's no other uh, questions, I think we'll just go ahead and wrap it up. Sounds good, folks. Right. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you for attending. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. for uh, Thanks, Roland. turning out tonight. Thank you. Joey, could you stay on for a minute, you and Roland? Yes, ma'am. Um, so thank you all. Good night. Good night, Glenn. Good night. Good night, Joey. Good seeing you all again. Good seeing you, man.